Hey, it's Nick Light. I am presently the Senior VP of Artist Development and Touring for RCA Records, Promoter 101 Podcast. Welcome to the 65th edition of the Promoter 101 Podcast. I'm your captain, Dan Steinberg, and we'll be cruising all show with Luke Pierce. Thanks, Dan. Got a jam-packed episode 65 for Promoter 101, where we're going to have CID Entertainment's Dan Berkowitz here to talk about some VIP ticketing. We've got Circle Talent's J.J. Cassieri, R&B concert promoter Gino Shelton, and we've got a special three questions with Point Entertainment's Philly's own Jesse Lundy. And of course, Dan and I will break down the news of the week. Hey, Luke, before we move on, I want to address the fact that lots of students listen to the podcast and they like to drink when you say 100%, but you've cut that out of your vocabulary since we started doing the podcast and we called you out on it. I think you're really making it not a drinker friendly podcast. What's up with that? I don't know if that's just one of those ticks and phrases that's phased out of the vernacular for me, but uh, I haven't been saying it. So I don't think it has anything to do with that comment on the podcast by any means. I just think I've probably gone on to whatever lexicon the kids are using. I, I like to inappropriately use or overuse whatever is in youth pop culture, lit, AF, all those terms I think are hilarious and like to overuse them in professional settings. So... I've probably just moved on to whatever else the kids are saying, man. The kids? Is that pretty woke right now? Uh, I think woke is like, we're like a little late on woke at this point. Well, you know, I'm always at the cutting edge of what the hip kids are doing. Just You're just living your best life, Dan. That's, that's all you're doing. So is there something current the kids can drink to that you're saying that would be fun to listen for? Uh, no, there's not really. I'm not sure of what I'm saying, but you'll know it's there when you hear it. So just drink whenever the fuck you want, essentially? Yeah, pretty much. I don't think you need to have a reason to drink. You gotta love that a lot of people listen to the podcast when they're working out, and then you got the kids that are listening to the podcast while they're drinking. And you gotta just love the dichotomy of that in our industry and our listenership. We're all across the board. We are drinker, gym-friendly podcasters, Dan. I find that uh, airport-friendly as well. It's a great way to avoid listening to the guy next to you. It's true. Let's jump into the podcast, shall we? Hey, this is Brandon Frankel at Promoter 101. Dan, we're finishing up on our world tour. You got to catch us live out there. Just days away, we're heading to FlyCon Conference in the Big Easy. That's New Orleans, folks, on January 16th, Tuesday, 2 p.m. Promoter 101 has very special guests from Lockin, the Brooklyn Bowl, the great Shappy, Peter Shapiro. Programming note, this interview will air on Friday, January 19th. Not on the 16th. We'll get it recorded and we'll put it up as normal on the following Friday. But if you have any questions for Shappy, email them, tweet them to us, get them to us on Messenger one way or another. We're putting that together now. And if you got something you want to ask the great one, Peter Shapiro, this is the time to tell us. Email us at promoters101 and let us know what we should be asking the great one, Mr. Peter Shapiro. Indeed, we just had our pre-interview with Shappy and prep for our FlyCon interview. I'm very excited about that. You know what else I'm also excited about? in New Orleans, Dan, is that Mr. Dreskin and his wonderful folks over at Ticketfly and Eventbrite have organized a second line parade for a conference attendees. So on Monday evening, if you're in New Orleans, somewhere around the Intercontinental Hotel, the host hotel of FlyCon, Look for a bunch of drunk marketers and talent buyers and agents and managers stumbling through the street because there will be the Ticket Fly FlyCon 2018 Second Line Parade. Get ready for it. You know, one of the other things that they're doing that I'm excited about is the session right after ours is Frank Riley interviewing Seth Hurwitz. It's a co-interview. They interview each other simultaneously. And I'm fucking excited to see that. I can't wait for us to get finished so we can go just sit in the audience and watch those two icons fuck with each other because, you know, that's going to be a very lively conversation. 
I've got to say, Flycon's lineup in terms of not just being about the central product of which the conference is named has been pretty great. They've lined up some great agents. They've lined up some great partners like Ant Taylor, who we're going to be interviewing uh, on the podcast next week and will air in subsequent weeks from Light. Lined up some amazing agents, some amazing promoters. Of course, we're doing the podcast, but it's a really well-programmed two-and-a-half-day conference. I'm very excited for my first time at Flycon. It's my second Flycon, and I'm really looking forward to it. Most in particular, Andrew Dusky does a state of the nation of what's going on in ticketing, in particular Ticket Fly. And anytime Andrew speaks, I'm always floored. So yeah, I'm looking forward to next week. Between now and then, we've got APEC conference to get through too, which is always one of the harder things on my liver. Two conferences back to back, literally. We've got some new announcements here, Dan. Just announced, just confirmed, Thursday, March 8th, heading across the pond to ILMC to moderate Tales from the Frontline with manager Paul Crockford. That'll be at the International Live Music Conference held at the Royal Garden Hotel in London. You can check it out at 30. Dot ilmc.com. So the great thing about this is it's not the podcast and it's not recorded. And the reason for this is it is a storytelling session. You're invited to tell your best, most epic tales from the industry. And shit talking is definitely not only allowed, but encouraged. So some of the biggest names in the industry come to this session in particular, tell some behind the scene tales. And unfortunately, we can't record it because it wouldn't be nearly as good. But I'm just honored that Paul and ILMC have asked me to co-host this. And it's the last thing. It's the dessert. And I've never been more honored to be included. That's a fantastic conference filled with just really colorful characters and done up very well for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, this is the International Live Music Conference. It's every March, top of the month in London. It's 30 years running now. And some of the panels and some of the interactions inside ILMC are something you're not going to find anywhere else in the world. Folks here in the U.S. and North America where business is done a certain way, it is eye-opening to begin to understand the differences between the workings of the live concert business between North America and UK and the rest of the world. It is just a whole different ballgame over there. Should be great. And the great thing about this conference is it puts you in the room with such great names internationally. You walk into that bar, which never closes, by the way. They don't stop serving until you're ready to go to bed. So you can walk in at 5 a.m. and you'll still see the Russians at the bar drinking. And they do. There's no question when it comes to it internationally, as far as this industry goes, the best in the bar that can go the longest, it's always the Russians year after year at that conference. But incredible, the access you have to the amazing international players on the scene at LMC. Just hats off to Greg and Glenn and Chris Prosser and Tom Hoppe, all the guys that get that conference and happening. It's amazing. I'm always over there floored by the amazing people they bring together. If you got something on your chest and you want to share it with us, this is a safe place. You can ask your questions. It's all right. Feel free to reach out to us by sending us an email to Steiny at promoter101.net. You can reach both of us at that email address. Absolutely. In the meantime, be sure to keep up with us on Twitter. Dan's at the Jew. I'm at W. Luke Pierce. And this podcast is at Promoters. That's Promoters, plural, 101. Hi, my name is Toby Layton Pope. I work for AG Presents in the UK and I'm on Promoter 101. Hey, if you've missed any of the past podcasts, you can always catch up at Promoter101.net. This week we feature a classic reissue of episode 22, featuring the godfather of online ticketing, Ticket Flies, Andrew Druskin, breaking down the stats of ticket sales. And by the way, it just so happens it's episode 22 and FlyCon's coming up this week. It just worked out that way as we've been going in order. No special Ticket Fly kickback, but hey, it worked out pretty nicely for us. What the hell? Also, ICM's Andrea Johnson talks about finding success with her artists, two cellos, piano guys, straight note chaser, Wilson Phillips. The list goes on and on. She's got lucky chops breaking now, too. If you haven't heard it, it's new to you. Check that out. Featured episode 22. And of course, if you are not subscribed to Promoter 101, what are you waiting for? Subscribe to Promoter 101 wherever you podcast. It takes two seconds. It's completely free. This is a free service we're offering to you. So sign up, listen, tell your friends about this podcast. And if you do it, tweet at us or send us a note. We'll send you a yo-yo or a sticker or something that says Promoter 101 on it. We're willing to bribe you for this at this point. Even if it's a bad review. I don't, we don't care. But yeah, we do. We're really shallow. Please don't give us any bad reviews. Hey, it's Elliot Lesko, Promoter from Golden Voice in Los Angeles on Promoter 101. It's time for the news of the week, Dan. A lot of shaking about here. This is a short news week for us. We're 
recording this on Wednesday in advance of APAP. So let's talk about what's happening out there in the live entertainment world. Let's talk about the move of Live Nation into Minneapolis. Live Nation is going to reopening the Varsity Theater. That's the 900 cap room in that market. Now heavily trafficked here. This the Varsity Theater had been closed for some time. The previous management had some allegations against them and the theater had closed. And now Live Nation slapping the banner on it. This is a really trafficked marketplace. And you know now we're seeing the entrance of Live Nation. This can be against the likes of First Ave folks and Nate Krantz and Sonia Grover, uh, as well as everything that's going on over at the Excel Center and Target Field here. Dan, what do you make of this move by Live Nation? Well, and it's more than that. I mean, you've got Rose Presents, who's an active player. You've got the Sue McLean office, who just lost their best talent buyer, Tamsin. You've got a lot going on in that market. Of course, guys like us jump in and out of that market. There's lots of players, AEGs in the game there as well. It's a very active market and has always been really cool. You've also got Don Sullivan always doing a handful of shows there. Jam is still very active in that market. It is a very, very active playing field when it comes to the Minneapolis market. But of course, Live Nation is going to be represented and it's about time they got into the game a little heavier. And I imagine the Chicago guys are ready to like amp that up to the next level. And Dan, speaking of Live Nation making moves into markets that are somewhat in your backyard, Live Nation has made a deal with Soda Jerk Presents Mike Barsh to take over long-term leases for Summit Music Hall and Marquee Theater. This is a report from Polestar. You had a chance to talk to Mike in advance of this podcast, right, Dan? I didn't. We'll play that for you in a moment. I think what's really interesting was they're taking over the operations of Mike's venues, but Mike has booked those for a very long time and not bringing Mike into the fold as part of Live Nation Denver, seems like a missed opportunity to me. But these are great venues to pick up, and we'll definitely have to see how that plays out, but it's definitely going to kick up the game for Denver Live Nation to the next level. Let's go ahead and roll out that interview with Mike. Mike Barsh, Soda Jerk Presents, big news in Denver. You guys just cut a big deal with Live Nation for them to take over two of your venues in Denver. Yes, we got it signed Friday of last week. Okay, so this is going to change the world a little bit because you guys have always been one of the more dominant independent promoters in the country, particularly in Denver, but you're going to give up your booking rights for those two venues. Live Nation's going to come in and operate those rooms themselves. That's going to be a big change of flow for you guys. Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely going to be a different look or a different vibe, if you will, but at the same time, I think they're pretty committed to keeping things business as usual. Both venues have been really successful. We're literally coming off our best year ever. They have staff over there that used to work for me previously, so they're intimately involved, familiar with the venues. I think they're going to do a great job. Now, are you going to still be able to come in and rent the venue and do the shows that you've done, or are you handing off all that history to them? Yeah, I think that's essentially the way it's going to go. Or is it going to be like that nobody in particular AEG deal where Doug essentially stepped out of the market? Yeah, I think that's a little more similar, a better example of what it'll look like. Soda Presents is going to continue. It remains. It wasn't part of the deal. We'll continue to own and operate the Black Sheep in Colorado Springs and our venue Hodes Half Note up in uh, Fort Collins. And Soda Jerk Presents can continue to book and promote shows at a certain levels in Denver. And then anything outside of Denver kind of have free reign there. It's really a big undertaking. Now, does Peter still exist as part of the Soda Jerk team? Peter Orr? Yeah, but he's going to stay with us. So I'll handle booking of Black Sheep and Hodes as well as any other shows that we book as Soda Jerk. There's such a major change in Denver. I mean, there's never been a week without a full page, full color ad in the Westward with all your <laughs> goings on in the market. This is a massive paradigm shift. That seems to be the reaction. Yeah. I mean, the shows are going to continue. They're going to continue to flow. It's just you know, somebody else is going to be presenting them. And if anything, there may even be a, an increase in volume, which is hard to imagine. I mean, all in, we did about a little over 850 shows last year. Now that's ridiculous. Now, for someone that is just a workaholic as you are, the idea of stepping back and doing less of anything just seems like a ridiculous concept. Yeah, I'm kind of struggling with that a little bit. It'll be nice to maybe have a little less on my plate. But, you know, at the same time, I still have three businesses to operate. So it's not like I have completely put my feet up by any means. If you need a hobby, you should think about uh, starting a podcast. Yeah, <laughs> it seems like uh, not a bad idea. Was there ever a negotiation or a conversation about them absorbing Soda Jerk Presents, or was that just not something you wanted? I don't think it really fit their goal or, you know, what they were looking to do. I mean, I think for them, they just, they recognized that they needed some venues in the market, and we kind of had what they were looking for. I don't necessarily think they needed 
to absorb us as a promoter. Hard to know what anybody else was thinking, but just an amazing company you've built, an amazing group of venues, and it seems like there's only good things to come on the horizons. But the shift is certainly a surprise in the Denver market. Should certainly help amplify Live Nation's fight against AEG in that particular market. I think it's a step in the right direction for them, yeah. Mike, congratulations. I'm sure there was a nice check that was involved with all of that. So uh, have fun figuring out which island you're going to buy. <laughs> and uh, look forward to seeing what's next with you, man. Thanks for taking the time. Right, man. I appreciate it. Great to have Mike on the podcast. Moving on, IQ is reporting that Jeff Meal joining Coda, former agency group UTA, says that he is delighted to start his next chapter of agency life at Coda. That's coming from IQ Magazine. Great to see some changes in the hands over there from the UTA family over to the Paradigm family of things in the UK. And stateside, Dan, we're excited to report that friend of the podcast, Brian O'Connell from Live Nation, is going to receive the CMA, that's the Country Music Association Touring Lifetime Achievement Award. This is an award that will be given out uh, January 22nd at the CMA Touring Awards at Marathon Music Works in Nashville, Tennessee. And this is something that's just well-deserved to one of the finest guys in the business. He's been on this podcast in an earlier episode, I think it was episode 19, where Brian came on and talked about his successes of promoting anywhere between 7 to 12 national tours at a time and starting a half dozen festivals uh, under the Live Nation banner. He's just been such an influential part of the country music live entertainment business for so long, and this is so deserved. And if you're looking to learn anything from a guy, definitely check out episode 19 of Promoter 101. Listen to his interview. He's also so in tune with the details and cares so much about the artist he's promoting and the events that he's creating. Congratulations to BOC, Brian O'Connell, and the CMA Lifetime Touring Achievement Award. Luke, if you're going to continue to talk badly about our guests like this, I don't know that we're going to be able to get anybody else on the podcast. I earnestly mean everything I say about that guy. He's just a fantastic human being and a fantastic promoter. Excited for him. That's all. He's a great guy and uh, excited that we get to partner some shows with him in the upcoming weeks. Big congrats to him on this Lifetime Achievement Award. Other moves throughout the industry, UTA Nashville has just picked up Jake Kennedy to join the UTA Nashville office. He's leaving CAA after five years there. Polestar is reporting. Congrats to you, Jake. And finally, this was the week of all the announcements for festival lineups rolling out here. Eminem Killers Muse are going to be headlining Bonnaroo 2018. And that was shortly followed by the announcement that Bruno Mars would headline Bottle Rock in Napa, California. Very excited about the latter lineup. It's one of the finest out there. I definitely recommend you check out Dave Graham's lineup for Bottle Rock Napa Valley 2018. I want to point out that Old Crow Medicine Show is playing Bonnaroo. In case some of you bluegrass fans missed it, there's still a little bit of original bluegrass, old school country vibe to that festival. But otherwise, it's the lineup looks pretty similar to every other festival that just got announced the last two weeks. Also, no weed at Coachella. They made that announcement after they announced their lineup. Coachella would be banning the use of cannabis despite it being a legal substance in 2018. <laughs> yeah, good fucking luck with that. Breaking news. The rumors are true. Frank's brothers have been acquired by Live Nation. Dave Brooks just broke the article in Billboard. We've got Larry Franks joining us. Congratulations on the check, Larry. <laughs> Thank you. To, let me explain to you what, what's going on here. Live Nation has entered into a joint venture with us, and they've made an investment into our company, and, and it will be buying a piece of Frank Productions, which encompasses Frank Productions Concerts in Madison, Wisconsin, headed up by Charlie Goldstone, and S2 in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, which is head up in my partner, uh, Darren Lashinsky, and Seymour Live, Chris Moore in Boise, Idaho. I'll be uh, joining the forces with Live Nation, but staying independent and uh, brand staying uh, as they are. Email addresses, everything stays the same. <laughs> so Darren, who's come from the world of Outback in the past, going back to that corporate world. And then, of course, Chris Moore's got his past history being at House of Blues already. So that should be a quite easy uh, jump back over for those guys. You guys have always been independent, true and through. So this is going to be a little bit of a new uh, day to day for you guys, you and your brother, Fred. Yes, it is new, but I don't think it's going to be that much different. Last spring, when Michael Rapino approached uh, Fred and I and wanted to chat, it was actually the first time I met him. After spending weeks trying to find a time where our schedules could meet, we had dinner with Michael and realized we both shared some of the same vision. What he proposed was making an investment into our companies and help us grow them and keeping them independent. So... 
No, we will not be a Live Nation office, but yes, we will be have an association with Live Nation, and they're committed to help us grow the company bigger and faster. So less likely that they'll be competing with you for things like the Metallica Tour moving forward. Yes, I think it definitely will stop the competition that we've been dealing with for many, many years, but it also gives us the opportunity to have a lot more tools in our toolbox to continue doing what we have been doing. Uh, we have no plans of changing the way we do business or how we do business. We just have more tools to work with. That sounds like an incredible opportunity for you guys to play both as an independent and have all the power of the biggest promoter in the world behind you and taking a competitor out at the same time. It seems like the best of all worlds. I think it's the best of all worlds for all of us, Live Nation and us. Fred and I saw nothing but opportunities, and our partners being Chris, Charlie, and, and Darren pretty much feel us the same way. It opens up a, a lot of doors and let us uh, continue our growth, but even faster. The last five years for us have been pretty crazy with the acquisition and the merger with the Majestic and acquiring all of those facilities, the purchase of the Heinen Saloon, and the soon-to-be uh, uh, open Sylvie uh, Music Hall here in Madison, Wisconsin. So this just will lead to more opportunities and faster. Growth on all fronts. Live Nation just continues to acquire, acquire, acquire. Amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time and talking to us, Larry. No problem, man. Hey, it's Pete Shapiro from Book and Bowl and a bunch of other stuff. And I'm going to be down at FlyCon on Promoter 101. Shit. Yeah. And finally, we want to take a moment to shine a spotlight on one of the hardest working indie promoters on the scene. Psycho Steve presents Steve Chilton. From the bars to clubs into the ballrooms, he is cranking some real business in the marketplace that is so competitive, making him this week's Promoter 101 Badass of the Week. Congrats goes out to you, Steve. Well fucking deserved. Hey, this is Mike Luganbill. Lenore Kinder. Tony Conway. Joe Atamian. Nick Gold. Jay Williams. Adam Voith. You're listening to Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Promoter 101. In our feature interview this week, we've got a special interview with CID Entertainment's Dan Berkowitz. Promoter 101. Got the icon that changed VIP ticketing for the world. Dan Berkowitz in the house. What's up, my friend? Hello, hello. How are you? Good. Thanks for taking time, dude. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a real honor. You have been just a global world traveler as of late. Yeah, I love my family. I love my two children. I love my wife. But I have been all over the place in the last couple of weeks. I was in Antwerp with Metallica. Antwerp with Metallica? What the hell? Why not? Antwerp with Metallica, City of Hope, with honoring Corin Capshaw here in L.A., back to Philly, and then back here for Billboard. Yeah, it's been a you know casual couple of weeks. Your public appearance schedule is insane. You, you perform more than some of the acts you guys do the VIP for. It's been getting busy. I really do like coming to, you know, we're at Billboard right now for everybody watching at home. So I like coming to these. I like seeing people. I like seeing people in our business. As you can imagine, Philadelphia is not really the hotbed of the emerging music business. So coming to these things, coming to Billboard, coming to Polestar, these types of events give me that access to the business at large. I think Jesse Lundy, Jeff Gordon, and a handful of other people like John Hampton would probably argue the point. There's something going on. Like Philadelphia is a really, really cool music town. It's just not the hub of the music business that I would like it to be. The mecca. Yes, if you will. Well, and you play inside a lot of different ponds, and you got to go to those hubs to make sure that you stay in that business. Yeah, and you know, you see people. There are the types of folks that you only see at conferences. There are types of folks that you see all over the place. There's agent friends, manager friends, promoter friends that I work with, and we get to see each other here. It's really, really neat. Let's talk about it. I mean, your world is synced up with your circle with the bigger guys that were in Jam that have now spread out to many different parts of the world. Don Strasberg, Mike Luba, those guys were very close personal friends of yours. Yeah, it's an interesting thing that's happened. A lot of us, a lot of the people that I work with worked within the jam band community back in, let's say, the late 90s, early 2000s. I did tour manage the Disco Biscuits. That was the first thing that I did in the music business. So I got to know a lot of people through that. Disco Biscuits had a lot of supporters. There were a lot of people that were on our side, people like Don Strasberg. People like Mark Shulman, Mark Brown, and Ethan Schwartz down in Florida. A lot of folks that loved the music and loved the band really supported them. So I met a lot of really good people through them. Everybody has seemed to have blossomed out into different parts of the industry. So our friends and social circle overlaps quite a bit. 
Yeah, so miraculously, you know, if you think about the jam band scene, I think about Mike Luba, you know, started with Madison House and the String Cheese Incident, and then went on to produce one of the most successful family entertainment tours of all time with Yo Gabba Gabba. And Jonathan Shank, who managed Particle and man- also managed the Disco Biscuits for about an hour and a half. I kid. It was, it was about, a, I think, a year and a half. But um, then Jonathan Shank went on to produce the Fresh Beat Band and Peppa Pig. Imagination Movers. Right. Ah, oh, the movers. Um, so oddly enough, my foray into family entertainment. And now we're known as within the family entertainment circle, we are the experiential providers. And it is 100% in part to relationships that were built 15, 20 years ago in the jam band scene. Yeah, it's funny. It's like we're doing Peppa Pig show together in Albuquerque, and I remember the note from the venue. Do you, we want to trust a third tier ticketing company for their VIP expense? You really want that on your contract? I remember copying you in. It was just like I think I know where they live. You're like actually they're fourth tier. Let me handle this. <laughs> I yeah, I mean, I think we're good. You know, that kind of brings up a sensitive yet topical point of conversation is the relationship that we have with promoters. You know, there's local promoters, there's national promoters, and we're not necessarily risk takers on shows. And we're an ancillary business. And for all of those at home, CID Entertainment is the side of our business that provides VIP tickets and travel packages for concerts and festivals. So if we're on a tour, let's say a Peppa Pig tour. Now, Peppa Pig, the pig is a beast, so she's doing great. But if we're on a tour, or if it's going okay, but the VIP is going well, and then the promoter might want to shave certain expenses and might, you know, would probably rather the VIP be in-house. We understand that there's a unique relationship that we have with promoters. So we have to, we're not just servicing the fans. The fans are our number one priority, but we need to be really, really easy to work with for the bands because otherwise they just wouldn't have us out on the road. And we need to be equally easy to work with and supplementary to the venue. We never want to cost you money. We want to help pay for any expenses that we're incurring. Dare I say we might overpay in certain situations where we're paying for certain catering or staff costs or or security costs. We're not trying to beat up any venues. We're trying to be partners with the venues. Like We want to leave a lasting good impression when we do Peppa Pig in Albuquerque. We don't want the people coming back to the venue saying that was a terrible experience because at the end of the day, we're going to leave Albuquerque. The building isn't. The building's going to be there the next time. So we understand that we need to do a really, really, really good job to stay in the good graces with the venues and the promoters that we work with. How you guys do it is really impressive. And I think I reached out to you the day after Metallica. I got to see the setup that they had in Seattle at Metallica for the VIP experience. I was looking for Metallica's friend in Gens entrance and stumbled upon the CID's VIP setup instead. And they're like, hey, do you want us to run you through and show you what we did? Which they were busy and they were fans taking care of their clients. But still, they took time to tour me around and show me what they were doing for Metallica. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. We're so lucky to work with Metallica. I mean, they put on such an incredible show and they care so deeply about their fans experience. They care so deeply about the experience for every single person that buys a ticket to see Metallica and it shows in their show. And there's a reason why they're so big so many years later. They are so engaged. You know, when we first started working with them, this was, a, as you can imagine, this was about a two or three year pitch process that was sort of a roller coaster of emotions. But finally, when it got close, I went out to Metallica HQ, sat down with the band and sat down with management and went into this meeting. We presented ideas and what they said to us was start at the top, give us the most engaging, most intimate experience that you could imagine. And we'll tell you what we don't want to do. Don't be afraid of suggesting things. And we basically said, we're not going to suggest people play on stage with you. Otherwise, we're going to really go for it on this. What we ended up with, which is substantially similar to the most engaging, intimate experience that we can imagine, are that 12 people get to meet the band. And then there's a bunch more people, hundreds more people that get to experience the Through the Never exhibit, which is in the VIP room. And what it is, is the band themselves went through and they chose some of their most prized possession and some of the most iconic pieces of Metallica history, instruments that they played, handwritten lyrics, set lists, 
pictures from all around the world, all, so many awards that they have won, outfits that they've worn, toys that they've collected, toys that have been made of Metallica, really anything that you could imagine to create this real super fan exhibit. And the way that people engage with that and that, you know, Metallica, they just can't meet hundreds of people. They've got a very busy day on show day. But for the people that they don't get to meet, everybody feels this authentic connection between them and the band. The reason I say authentic is because it's real, because the band was involved, because they said, we want to give these people something that they could never experience otherwise. As you can imagine, if you're in Seattle, well, Seattle's kind of a bad example because it's sort of close to where they live. But if you're in Miami, there's probably no other way that you could see a Metallica exhibit. Or Antwerp. Antwerp's a much better example. Um, it's just such an amazing experience. And all of the credit goes to the band and to Mark Ryder and to Tony D and to their incredible team for allowing us to do what we do by basically handing us that program and saying, this is what we'll do. And for the 12 people that get to meet the band... Is that a lottery system kind of thing? No, no. 12 people buy. I mean, it, it's basically a lot of... It's the, it the VIP of VIPs. Yeah, it sells out instantly. But those people, so they come into a room and they meet the band. The band comes in and obviously, as you can imagine, it gets pretty tense right before the band gets in. The nervous energy is through the roof. The times that I've been there, I probably am participating in, that, in said nervous energy. But the band walks in and immediately... You know, Lars will sometimes be the first one in and maybe crack a joke. Like, he'll walk in and be like, sorry, guys, it's just me today. And, like, you know, kind of just relieves the tension from the room. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the other three just walk in right behind him. But it's such a moment to see these people's favorite band who they've never been able to get closer than a couple hundred yards away. And they've obviously never had a personal one on one interaction. That moment when the band comes in, you know, everybody comes and they take a picture with the band. So each person takes a picture with the entire band. And then they get to sign something, anything that they bring. And then they do kind of, it's not a meet and greet. It's like a hang with the band and it's 45 minutes long. But it's all 12 people hanging with them simultaneously, right? No. I mean, each band member basically goes up to each person individually knowing that that's what that person wants. And that person, like if, and I'll kind of give away a little bit of the secret sauce, but like. But they're not sitting in like actor chairs, like talking no, to the 12 people. No, they're actually working the room. The people stay where they are. They stay in place and the band works the room. And that's the way that we set it up. Similar to like. A VIP hang after a show when you know the band, a friend and family kind of meet and greet. I mean, but it's a lot more interesting than that. Like, oddly enough, it's so engaging in these fans. And we've had five, six hundred people come through the program. We have had zero issues. Everybody that's been through has been such a pleasure to be around. And clearly you're meeting your favorite act. You're, you're meeting Metallica. You know, you're not just meeting anybody. And everyone has been so respectful and so kind and so interested in such a way that's so endearing. And it's just gone incredibly well. And again, the credit goes to the band for the way that they interact with their fans. Does that come with a pit pass? In a lot of venues where we could do it, we surprised everybody with the snake pit pass. But technically, it came with a riser near front of house where these 12 people would be. Okay. When we could do it, we gave them snake pit passes, which are in most of the uh, stadium. U.S. stadium dates. Yeah. And to, to watch a Metallica show in the snake pit, I don't know if you got that opportunity. I did have that opportunity opportunity but it's it's so incredible and like admittedly i grew up a grateful dead and fish fan so it's not like this was like the thing for me it wasn't my everything but i've always l really liked and respected metallica but seeing that show in the snake pit the stimulation yeah. overload of the video the band running around you right. the sound being in the middle of all of it between you and me probably more shows than most people have ever seen live so for us to be impressed by a live production is something and to that point there's something wrong with me in that I i'm not jaded you know, like I'll cry at a concert, you know, I'll get that moved, I'll get emotional. And like, I fall in love with new bands all the time. Like, there's a jam band called Spafford, who I really, really like right now. And for somebody my age who goes to see so many concerts, it's pretty rare, I think. So I wouldn't discount my appreciation for Metallica by saying that I usually don't appreciate things. But you're right. For as many shows as I see, it's still it's something I'll never, ever forget seeing them in the snake pit. I and mean, we can talk about Metallica for hours, but I'll save that for Mark Ryder's interview when we finally get him. Let's talk about the VIP experience, which has changed the industry across the board. It's made it so acts can afford to do things without raising their ticket prices up. It's allowed them to play the right size venues. It's made it so they can tour in a bus or with an extra semi. It's brought money into the pot that wasn't there and that the average fan doesn't pay more money. You guys have changed the game. I appreciate that. And to that point, I don't like the word VIP and specifically on Metallica, we, we call it the enhancement. 
enhanced experience. Why, excuse me? Yeah, that's something that I should have started saying about 15 minutes ago. So excuse me. It's the Metallica enhanced experience. Because really, when you think about it, you know, VIP stands for very important person. Nobody, and I mean this to all of the people that are listening that buy our packages, if you buy a package from CID, it does not make you more important than anybody else. You're entitled to more amenities, the specific amenities that you've purchased that night. You get to go into this special room or you get to have a private performance from Luke Bryan before the show or you get tickets in the first 10 rows. You get a signed poster, but you're not more important than the other people that are going to the show. There would be no, and I say VIP and I'm doing air quotes for all the people at home. There'd be no VIP if there weren't the 95 to 99.9 percent of the show that's not buying a VIP ticket. So I would dare to say that they're the more important part of the show. People that are not buying an enhanced experience ticket. So now that we've kind of covered that, and I didn't mean to get on such a tangent there, I really appreciate the way you described it. It's humbling to hear that what we do can actually have an effect on the industry at large. We work together, like we're in this together. And that's a very hippy dippy way of viewing the world. But I also appreciate the fact that 20 years ago, when we started seeing the original transformation of the industry where this was coming in, and it wasn't just radio winners, but we were selling the opportunity to be included with the radio winners, which is basically what that was. It was my job to host that. And you take that pressure off of me. Not only do you create a better experience, but on top of running a show, I don't have to worry about throwing a party for the band's guests. You guys host that and set that up. You just need space from me. Yeah, again, I I definitely would be remiss if I didn't mention Shelly Lazar and SLO. And and Shelly literally invented the game. You know, she was doing friends and family ticketing for the likes of the Stones and Paul McCartney. They all decided, wait, What if we sold some of these tickets to people we don't know and added some amenities and called it a VIP experience? Because she would sell VIP tickets to actual important people to the band. And this is kind of that whole VIP argument where, and Jeff Gordon's a good example because I actually use him as an example. Jeff Gordon, to me, is a VIP. You know, I was a runner at the Electric Factory. Like, that's kind of where I come from. You know, I've birthed out of Jeff Gordon. So the imagery of that is just awesome. If Jeff, it was a it was a pain. Painful labor. Um, <laughs> if, if Jeff comes to one of our shows, I'm going to roll out the red carpet. If I am there, I'm going to open up the back door. I'm going to get Jeff in. I'm going to slap whatever pass he needs on him. And I'm going to make sure that Jeff is super comfortable. He's a VIP. Now, when Shelly started selling that access, that's where the whole idea of like these being VIP tickets came from, because that's what she did. She sold friends and family access to patrons. So that's really how the this side of the business started and she's got some really incredible stories about working with Bill Graham and they would have people in Grateful Dead parking lots bring them 10 trash bags of trash and they would let those people in first and that was basically the first VIP experience yeah you had to clean up the parking lot at Alpine Valley and you got in first that I didn't know I I, I, I might have made it up that it was Alpine Valley but in my mind I romanticized it and made it that parking lot you got to bring the enhanced experience To the Grateful Dead reunion shows, the Fare They Well. Yes, I did. That had to be a dream come true. There's never been a greater honor for a hippie from Cherry Hill, New Jersey to get that call. To say that I personally and professionally peaked on that day, I think is a little hyperbolic. But if I did, that's also okay. Um, So I would say outside the birth of my children and marrying my wife, I may have personally peaked that day. But I'll never forget it. And you guys rock that. You guys had all these amazing experiences that different rooms set up and things, but everything went perfectly. You guys took such responsibility and care of pulling that off. So Pete Shapiro calls me and Pete's like, hey, I think I'm actually going to get this done. Now, mind you, you know, this was in year 49 of their GD50, but in year 49, we started actually planning. But I would say at year 45, Pete said, I'm going to do this. Like It's the 50th year. It's this year. And if there's one person on the planet to play guitar, it's Trey. And unless we get Trey, we're not doing it. And I'm going to pull this off. And I'm like, yeah, whatever, Pete. And then I get the call. He's like, I did it. It's happening. Let's go. And I said this to Pete, and we said it all the time. If we screw this up, we're going to ruin the legacy of the band that we all love and the reason why we do what we do. So that's the gravity of the situation. And the fans, the Grateful Dead fans, which I consider myself one of, have such a connection to this band, unlike any fan base in any band on the planet. It deserved the respect that we showed it, and it deserved the amount of work that went into it. And it wasn't perfect. It was not without its flaws 
but much like a Grateful Dead show, it all really worked out in the end. And there were some hiccups along the way, but it ended up on those show days. And specifically, we'll talk about Soldier Field. It was 79 degrees. July in Chicago can be very unpredictable. It was 79 degrees with zero humidity and not a cloud in sight. And it were three of the most beautiful days I've ever spent in Chicago. And then the day after on Monday, it poured and it was humid. Don't you think from the announcement of that show, having Trixie Garcia do the video invitation, an announcement to the world, it said from the Garcia family, this is something that we stand behind and we think that dad would too. Yeah. You just saying that gave me the chills because that was it. And to see them at the show, to see Trixie at the show, like having the time of her life and to see so many people that are in the Jerry camp, which as you can imagine, you know, imagine what happened to that organization when he died. You know, it wasn't just the guitar player that everybody liked. He was the leader of that organization. To see everybody really come back together and to see all the fans. I mean, literally everyone was there except for Kevin Morris. We always say that. Like every single person was at GD50 that should have been there. It doesn't mean that if you've never heard of the Grateful Dead, you were there. But for all of us, it was like this big celebration of life and celebration that we've ever done. And I was going to get to it. And, you know, at this point, I would say that in America, there was still a lot of hope in the air. It was a July 4th concert. They're an American band and Pete and I would talk 10, 15 times a day leading up to the show for months on end. We'd end every single conversation with God bless America and God bless the Grateful Dead. And we knew that like we had a mission. By the grace of God, we pulled it off. I think the industry in general and the fans all came away with the same experience. I got to watch and go as a fan, but know enough about the industry to see all the pitfalls that you guys could have stumbled in and noticed that you didn't. Yeah, I mean, there were issues. You know, there were issues. Well, there are live shows for three days in a stadium. Shit's going to happen. Yeah, but even leading up to it with the announcement and the on sale and the Frankie with GDS2 with the mail order ticketing and the demand was just unprecedented. Like we were hoping that two of the three shows would sell out by show day. Really? Like that was the goal. Like we were like, okay, maybe the Friday night won't, but Saturday night's July 4th and then Sunday's the last show Show ever. ever. So those will probably go all the way by show day. And if we can do 40,000 tickets a night on the on sale, we'll probably go all the way by show day. We'd never, ever, ever seen anything like it. And I think there were something like 375,000 three night orders, which means that, you know, they sold the place out seven times over, six times over just via mail order where they could do I think 50% of the house because they're grandfathered into that Ticketmaster rule. So, you know, there were pitfalls. There were definitely logistical issues with dealing with that demand, just scaling the house issues, going all the way to 360. I mean, it wasn't 100% going to be 360 on all three nights, I believe, at first. I might be wrong there. We might have changed our minds weeks before the announcement, but or Pete might have changed his mind. But for the little part that we played, Pete produced the show in conjunction with AEG and Mike Luba and Don Sullivan. But we were so honored to be a part of that and to get to take care of the fans that we took care of and get to experience what we experienced. And the team that we had on it was so good. I did not miss a single note of music. Really? Yeah, not a note. That's impressive. Yeah, I mean, we had an incredible team on it. And this is the band, you know, when I would sit in high school and instead of paying attention, I would imagine what would fulfill me, I would imagine throwing concerts with the likes of Grateful Dead and Fish. And this was it for me. And of course, I needed to make sure that the work was right, that the experience was great for all of our guests. And I was there at doors. I was there at early entry. I was there when it mattered, you know, but once the party got rolling and I was there for days leading up to it to make sure that our rooms were good and everything was going to be set up right. But once it got rolling, our team really took over. I would say that out of the entire organization, like I'm the deadhead. There's definitely a lot. There's a lot of people that love the Grateful Dead within our organization. But for me, I was at front of house or I was just roaming around. There were just so many people to see, so many friends there. I loved it. Let's talk about when an act is ready for that enhanced experience. Because it's not for everybody, but now we're seeing it in the clubs and in the theaters and the ballrooms. If there's a fan club and there's fans, there's probably something extra there. Yeah, if there's people that care about your act, which there hopefully should be, then there's somebody that 
wants something a little bit more. So we have something right now that's called our Artist Alliance Program, and we can work with developing acts. And I think Dustin Lynch is a really good example of this. He's a, a I wouldn't even call him up and country, uh, up, up and country. That's funny. Should be a new blog, up and country, <laughs> like the up and coming country acts. Trademark. So um, <laughs> Dustin Lynch, who was an up and coming country artist, but is now arrived in his headliner in his own right. But Dustin Lynch, we started as an Artist Alliance Program, which to us means we're not sending somebody on the road. You know, one of our calling cards for better or for worse for years was that every time we did anything, we sent somebody. So there'd be somebody on the tour bus, multiple people on the tour bus and tours like George Strait. There's four people out on the road. Tours like Metallica, there's four people out on the road. But for Artist Alliance, we don't send somebody out on the road. You're basically the wraparound support system, but they show the tour manager and the local crew have to figure it out. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times we'll have local crew that go there. We have an incredible ambassador network of thousands of people throughout the country. And in most markets, I would say 95% of the markets that concerts typically play in, we've got a really good local representative. So sometimes we'll send somebody. But the way we deal with it is it'll be a pretty simple program. It'll be a meet and greet. It'll be a signed poster and it'll be early entry. So if you imagine any club environment, Environment. What we're going to do is we're going to send wristbands to the box office. We're going to say, hey, Steiny, here's your 20 people and here's their names. And they're going to come at 455. Your normal doors are going to be six. 455 is a bad time. Let's say 530. They're showing up at 530. And if you need to pay your box office person extra to open a half hour early, we'll gladly cover it. And um, here's your 20 people. They're going to show up and they're going to get these wristbands. We'll mail them to you. They're these green wristbands that say CID. They say Dustin Lynch and they have the date on them and they get in early and that basically functions as their early access. And that gets them to the, you know, they'll usually choose front of the stage. And then after the show, what's going to happen is we're going to email them. We've already emailed them or we're texting them or and we're texting them. And they all know to meet stage left because we've coordinated that with you already with the building. And they're going to meet stage left. We actually send them a picture and say, this is what stage left means. And it's a generic picture. It's not a picture of every club. But you're going to meet here relative to the stage. And at that point, the tour manager who we work with comes out, grabs these folks, already has the posters ready. Maybe they also go to the merch table to get the poster. Depends on the tour. Or the tour manager has the poster. And they do a quick meet and greet. They'll do a, a photo op. And then they'll be on their way. And that's a very low cost, high engagement low volume way for artists to start interacting with their fans. And it's not something that costs the artist a lot of money to do. And more importantly, it's not something that costs the fans a lot of money to do. We're talking about 20, 30, 40, $50 lift on top of a ticket. So for a developing artist, that's a really, really great way of starting to engage with your fans in a way other than simply hanging out at the merch stand or going out to the tour bus and meeting people all night, which I'm not saying is a bad idea. We did start to notice that we wanted to engage with artists earlier. And Dustin Lynch is a really good example. He's somebody that we've known for four years because he's been on every single Crash My Playa. And we just announced him today on Crash My Playa, our country music event that we produce in Mexico. And this is maybe the one thing I'll take credit for is I saw something in Dustin and said, we have to work with this guy. He is special. He relates with the fans in such a unique way. He's a genuine guy. Also, he makes great music and people love him. So we're really proud to still be in business with Dustin. And that program has graduated from an Artist Alliance program into an actual uh, CID program where we put somebody out on the road. So you guys have something for every level of touring act from a van in a van all the way up to a stadium tour like Metallica and you're not really sticking to one genre jumping from the Grateful Dead into country into metal you guys are really playing on all sides yeah I mean people ask what kind of music we work with and I say luckily we work with music that people care about that's all that matters to us do people care about this act do people care and do people care about this band do people care about the DJ do people care about Peppa Pig and as long as they care and as long as the act cares about their fans that's why when I look at our roster I'm like wow it really looks like we've handpicked a bunch of special artists, but that's not the case. Those artists have picked us because we're not, I'll say it, we're not the cheapest alternative. People beat us on pricing. Other VIP providers will beat us basically in a race to the bottom that we don't participate in. We've got 12 people that are in the office that their only job is answering emails and live chats and phones from our guests. We've got a 75 person team. So we can't be the cheapest alternative. So the artists that work with us 
choose to work with us knowing that there's a better deal out there. But, but the support system involved with your system is fan friendly. Yeah. And no disrespect to the folks that are doing what we do and can offer better pricing. But with CID, you get more, you get then literally more and for better or for worse. And there's other artists out there that just want that better deal. It doesn't make them wrong. It doesn't make them bad for the type of program that they're offering. They're probably getting a great service. But for the artists that we work with, they're all basically choosing to work with us over other providers based on the work that we do. Let's talk about CID Presents. You guys have gotten into doing some high-end destination events. Yeah, we've taken our completely risk-averse business and flipped it right on its head, (laughs) and we've put everything at risk. So we are now producing our own events, our own destination events, and not just destination events, because this last weekend we produced a Josh Groban show in New York. We produce a Luke Bryan show in Mexico, a Fish show, a Dave Matthews show, and now we've got uh, Dead and Company coming up in uh, in February of 2018. As you said, you got into a business that now has skin in the game, that you're financially involved with these events. What made you want to take risk? So it was always the dream. I don't want CID to stay stagnant. I don't want CID to be a one-trick pony. And producing events for us was really always the dream. We will always do what we do on tours, supporting artists with our enhanced experience, our VIP programs, and our travel packages. For me, producing shows is kind of the culmination of everything that we do. We haven't really gotten into it, but supporting festivals and working with Coachella being by far the biggest and best festival program that we run, getting to see these festivals up close and getting to see, to call them anything short of geniuses at work would be a disservice, but getting to see Skip, Paul, and Bill throw Coachella gave us a competitive advantage. And we saw Coachella up close. We saw Bonnaroo up close. We saw Lollapalooza up close. We saw Jazz Fest up close. And we also had these incredible relationships with these artists that we were working with on tour. So oddly enough, and I don't know if I've ever really told this story outside of like CID meetings, but my cousin got married in 2005 at the Barcelo Resort in in the Riviera Maya. And this is in 2005. I was the Disco Biscuits tour manager. And I looked at this resort. I was like, wouldn't it be cool if Fish played there? I like, (laughs) I, I like thought it to myself. So when we started working with Fish in 2009, which was an incredible moment in itself, and we started with Fish Festival 8, and as soon as we got that relationship, and and as soon as we started working with them, and as soon as they took me seriously, which took them a little while, I started saying, we should do a destination event together. Like, let's go. I'll start looking for venues when you're ready. And, uh, you know, I mistakenly waited for them to be ready, which they never were. It was never the right time. So then I just went out and started looking for venues on my own. So in 2013, I started the search and I started with the place my cousin got married because I was like, I'm just going to at least go check this out because I remember what I thought I saw. And I'll never forget the moment where Thomas, who we work with now at the hotel, brought me. He's like, no, 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 no. I actually have the better place for you because I was like, yeah, we can do it right over there. And he's like, no, no, no. Let me show you. And he walked me around this corner, showed me this beach. And I was like, oh, my God. It was like, yes, this is where I want to do it. And then like an idiot, I said, this can't possibly be it. I'm not done because it was the first place I went back to. So I saw 30, 35 other resorts all throughout the Caribbean, spent the next six months vetting them, being like, no, I've got to put a little more work into this. This isn't going to be a layup. But of course, I came back to the Barcelo and it was if the Barcelo's a 10, the closest other thing I looked at was like a six or a seven. And to keep it clean, because the events that we were going to throw were similar in nature to what Cloud9 was doing, I went to none of their resorts. You know, I wanted to keep it clean. You think about it, like think about it from the hotel side. Like here I show up, dude who has company that does VIP ticketing in the United States, like knocking on doors, like, um, excuse me, I'd like to maybe throw a concert on that beach if you don't mind. And the first question would be like, have you ever done this before? And my answer would just be like, nope. So miraculously, and this was 2013 going on to 2014. So we finally decide that we're ready to do it. And we start talking to Fish and to Luke Bryan and to some other artists. And I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention my former partner, Chewy, who is a dear friend and almost consider him a family member, was part of the birth story of my first child being born. He came to the hospital to support my wife and I. So Chewy had the Luke Bryan relationship. Jay Williams is his boy. And we worked with Luke a lot. We've been on his tour for three, four years. So we all had a relationship there. But Jay said yes to our wacky plan. And Luke said yes. It wasn't just Jay. So it was Jay. It was Luke. It was Corin. It was Carrie. And 
and interesting is that obviously the Corin Bridge is what gets us over that fish hump. So miraculously, our first show was successful. And obviously, from being a promoter and from knowing other promoters, it's pretty rare that your first show is successful. So miraculously, our first show was successful, and that was Crash My Playa in 2015. You know, we had a small singer songwriter who had never released an album before that didn't even have a band whose name is Chris Stapleton support Dustin Lynch. We had Dirks Bentley. We had Cole Swindell. We had a fantastic lineup for a deadhead. You got quite the grasp on country music, my friend. I think it all has to do with my love of music. It is what it is. You know, like Luke knows what Luke is. And that's why Luke is so good at being Luke Bryan. It is such a unique experience. And to me, it's a rock show like this big overblown production and these big songs with these awesome choruses. And Luke is just such a good dude and relates to his fans in such a great way. And I don't know. I love like I love that scene. You know, I love these guys. And I think the reason why CID connects with country music and country music fans so much is the country music artists want to give so much to their fans. They want their fans to have such a great experience at a good value. So we're aligned with those values. The first thing we ever did was successful, and we invited Jason Comfort down, who's Red Light's head of ticketing as well, and he had a fantastic time, and we showed him what he could do, and Jason is a trusted member of the fish camp as well. Richard Glasgow, who's a dear friend of mine, finally agreed to come down with me and look at the venue after we had successfully thrown a Luke Bryan show, and said, yep. I think you might be right. I think we might do a fish show here. And for me, that was like earth shattering. Like, really? Are we really going to do this? And Corin trusted us more and more. We were doing Luke. We were doing Dirks. We had done good work with fish. He'd seen what we did with Fairly Well and, you know, miraculously agreed that we should do it. And, you know, Luke and Fish then turned into Luke, Fish and Dave. And I wish I could talk about it here. But 2018, early 2018, we're going to have three shows. And then 2019, it looks like five or six, but we're with all pretty substantial like-sized bands. So had your cousin not gotten married, none of this would ever happened. Shout out to Jordan Epstein. <laughs> Definitely not listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, what's funny is like, I think we all probably have similar stories where we all wish that we were around our family more growing up or I, I maybe we don't, you know, I was the one that was seeing fish in the disco biscuits, you know, as much as I could. And it's a really special bond that my cousin and I have now. Uh, I'm very, very thankful. That's awesome. I can't think of a better place to stop with the success of both your promotion side of your company and the explanation of enhanced tickets, which I will never call VIP experience again. Well, thank you all very, very much. So the idea is setting the bar high above the rest when it comes to the enhanced fan experience. The rest of the business is going to have to catch up and try because he's clearly setting the pace. This is Andrea Johnson from ICM Partners, and you're listening to Promoter 101. It's that time of the week, Dan. We're going to take a moment and break down what you were thinking when you wrote each of these Promoter 101 tweets. Let's start here. When you check your email with your first sip of coffee and you have your first vision of how massively, insanely busy today is going to be. It seems to be less downtime in our business the more and more the business goes on. So we really have to just start and enjoy those moments that we get because there's just less and less of them. In my own mind, I'm just a 1980s WWF bad guy wrestling superstar manager stuck in the body of a modern day concert promoter. It's a little more insight to me than maybe there should be. I guess this should be a hashtag Steiny 101. That moment when you realize your friends are now running the industry, hashtag Promoter 101. I think we all still see ourselves at 18 years old. So it's really hard sometimes to realize that we've been, at least I've been doing this for the better part of three decades. And it's just always amazed to see how far some of my friends have come and very proud of all of them. That does it for Promoter 101 Tweets of the Week. You can follow Dan on Twitter. He's at the Jew. And if you have your own Promoter 101 thoughts, feel free to tweet them at us, email them over, anything that makes us smile get used in this podcast. Hello, it's Kevin Lyman from the Vans Warp Tour, and you're on Promoter 101. This week, we're going to bring back a favorite segment of ours that we've not done for quite some time. It's the three questions portion where listeners turn the table on you and I by asking us questions. Most importantly about this, Dan and I don't have the questions in advance. This week, we're going to be joined by Point Entertainment's Jesse Lundy, calling in from Philly. The great Jesse Lundy. Welcome to the podcast, Jesse. Thanks a bunch, Dan. It's cold here on the East Coast, and it makes me feel warm to be in the presence of friends. Now, in all fairness, 
Jesse didn't remember the rule that we don't see the questions in advance, so I actually may have seen these in advance just to keep the record straight. But with that said, I saw them about 30 seconds ago, so all fair. But I just wanted to be like straight up, keep the uh, journalistic integrity of the show in line. Very high integrity. I'd like to think that we're somewhere between like the guy that you talk to when you're pumping gas and the guy at a toll booth, like collecting money, like as far as the integrity of the show, like we have that bar. I don't know what that means. Anyway, Jesse, let's get to it. What are your questions? All right, I have a question for Luke. Luke, when we hung out at the APA party at Americana, you suggested that we take a look at some home free shows together, but I haven't heard back from you yet. Does that mean that we're confirmed? (laughs) I think Luke might have sold me those dates. Luke, what's the story with those dates? Jesse, it was a fantastic hang at Americana Fest, and thanks to all the folks at APA for hosting us. And Jesse's a great example of folks that we've corresponded over socials for like a couple years and finally got to meet face-to-face, and Jesse's from my adopted hometown of Philly, and we talked about doing some stuff at the beautiful Colonial Theater in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, which incidentally is where they shot the movie The Blob. I don't know that scene, Dan, if you've seen... Everybody run out of the theaters at the end. That's where the blob was shot. We talked about doing some home free dates there. Unfortunately, I do have a almost sold out show with David Farrar's Reading, Pennsylvania, just right around the corner there. So we're going to have to talk about 2019 at this point, man. But excited to be doing some shows with Point Entertainment here in the future and excited to be back in Philly. Hey, wait, you're selling shows to other people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, Dan, we actually do work with like one or two other people. What else you got, Jesse? Dan, I feel like Philadelphia is the most competitive market in the country, and maybe that's just because I'm here. What other markets do you think might be more competitive than Philadelphia? I think that's a grass is always greener kind of thing. I mean, that's the boat you sit in, so you know what you're not getting there. And that's always a promoter thing. There's definitely a FOMO thing, a fair missing out going on when you're in a market. Because we're a national promoter and we get to see all the other markets, I get to see a greater picture. And from that, I can tell you that I think Denver in particular is possibly the most aggressive market in the country. As far as buying talent, as far as marketing, I think New York is the hardest market to market in because you can't afford to buy media. So you need to have the email list or partner with someone that does. But there are some super competitive markets out there. There are some easier markets to be out there too, but usually the competitive markets Markets mean the stronger talent buying market to be in. And that's what everybody's looking for, those great markets. Seattle out here where I'm at is also one of the toughest markets. There are so many buyers and it's incredible. Like You've got great concert markets. You can't forget Chicago, amazingly difficult market to buy in. All the New Jersey markets, incredibly competitive. Boston is insane, but Philly is right up there. There are a lot of players And you look at some legendary guys playing that game. AEG is doing a fantastic job and they got some good venues. And then you look at the other side and it's like Jeff Gordon, John Hampton. Holy shit. That's some booking power right there. I agree. Many talented people you just named off for sure. It would be remiss if I didn't mention Larry Maggot also still oversees a lot of what's going on in that market and books from there, although he's kind of warped into being a national promoter now. Definitely a national, if not international at this point. Larry is of the elk of a Bill Graham and a John Shear. He is one of the original guys that invented the business. And the fact that he's still doing it and he's very involved in the electric factory and that whole world, the guy is fascinating. His work with Billy Chris. Crystal, Bette Midler, he does a lot of the Gladys Knight dates and the OJs. He is very, very active. King Crimson, the guy works. And you got to respect the volume that he does, the business that he does, the fact that he's been able to evolve with the industry as it's grown. Hats off to Larry Maggot. He gave me my first job, so hats off to him, absolutely. Shit, we skip Bill Rogers completely and talk about an icon. All these guys in the same market. You know what? There's probably a reason I stay the fuck out of Philly most of the time. <laughs> That's a good segue for my last question, Dan. Back in the old days, you used to call me for advice about shows. You got a job so I can get the hell out of Philly once and for all, please? I think we've offered you jobs throughout the year. You always say no. Uh, look who's an idiot. It's me. <laughs> now, I think you've done very well for yourself. You and Rich built one hell of a company there and the educational program that you guys are involved with teaching the next generation of the industry. And truth be known, I still call you for advice from time to time. 
We'd love to have you come in and talk to the kids at Drexel anytime, Dan. Absolutely. Next time we do a show in Philly, let's work that out for sure. That would be great. Right on. Me and Luke love having you on Promoter 101. We got to get you in for an interview sooner than later. But man, it was great talking to you. And thanks for being on Promoter 101, Jesse. Thanks, Dan. I think Springfield said it best. Jesse is a friend. Yeah, I know he is a good friend of mine. But lately something's changed. And that ain't hard to define. Because I want to be Jesse's. No. It's great to have Jesse Lundy on the podcast. He's fucking awesome. If you too want to be on Promoter 101, drop us an email to promoter101.net and let us know that you want to ask us the questions and turn the table on me and Luke. This is Anthony Diaz with Six Man on Promoter 101. In our second interview this week, we're joined by Circle Talent's JJ Cassieri, who's an agent who's out there truly killing it right now. Very excited to welcome JJ to Promoter 101. As always, we got the best of the best. Circle Talent's King of Rock. JJ, thank you for taking the time to be with us. Thanks for having me. You represent the upcoming fresh face of the new music industry, particularly active rock. Yeah, I would say rock, metal. I mean, my roster is kind of all over the place. It formed from, of course, the Warped Tour, metalcore, metal rock scene. But I wouldn't say active rock, but I would say there's a mixture of little sprinkles in there, you know? Circle Talent would fit nicely into what was the original agency group kind of brand. Like, you guys have those cool Warped Tour rock acts, the up-and-coming stuff that rock the ballrooms, 500 to 2200 seat open floor rooms. And the open floor room thing is a really key demo. You guys are big on the barricades. For sure. Yeah, definitely. The- a lot of black t-shirts going through the birch table <laughs> a lot of black tees a lot of makeup a lot of long black hair <laughs> high school angst coming out hardcore <laughs> seriously <laughs> so rock and roll still exists in that warp tour world it's changed it's gotten a little more poppy over the years yeah it's weird man it's like now more than ever i think though there's a resurgence of like this metal metal core with bands like ghost ghost but then the wave of pop punk made a resurgence you know years ago and you know, like the story so far and all these young pop punk bands you know it comes in waves this whole thing but now more than ever like people want heavy music you know rock metal music let's take a sidestep for one second we'll get back into music you've got a side project that has been taking up a lot of time but you've seen some success acting yeah yeah um, my buddy ash avildsen you know from sumerian records good friend of mine you know he used to be my roommate he started dabbling and being a director and writing movies and you know wanting to put out and direct his own films and did my first one with him two years ago called what now it was like a romantic comedy hulu picked it up for a minute and it was pretty awesome and then recently like last month or so another movie he directed his second one called american satan it's pretty much gauged around rock and roll and metal actually it's about like this band that gets formed you know, through the internet and like, the, and I don't want to give it away, but they pretty much, these, these group of kids form a band and it's their journey through Hollywood to make it in being a band in LA. So hitting close to home. Yeah, exactly. That came out last month and AMC picked it up and did a whole distribution deal. Been really successful. And so, your role in particular? You know, I, uh, what now the first one I was a lead, you know, in the romantic comedy film, but this one, I'm a, I play a tour manager. I used to be a tour manager before I was an agent. So it's like, fit me perfectly so there's the band that the movie's about and then there's the headlining band that i'm the tour manager for and i throw the you band to be a dick correct yeah i throw them off the tour because we're jealous because they're blowing us out all this shit goes down and i'm like the angry tour manager like you're off the tour and blah 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 yeah cool and your outer appearance gives you that rock and roll look like most tour <laughs> managers have you got the full arm sleeve tattoos yeah the beard the bald head it's like pretty intimidating guy to bump into yeah it was, it was fun though it was an it was awesome. Uh, about s- seven or eight scenes, I would say, but it were pretty like distinctive ones of me yelling and screaming and being a crazy tour manager. So I can yeah. see it. It's like we should recast <laughs> Almost Famous with you right now. Get <laughs> Cameron on the phone. <laughs> That'd <be> sick. <laughs> Are you hoping to do more of that? Are you enjoying it? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, also there's a company called the Beard Club. You know, like Dollar Shave Club, mm-hmm. but there's a Dollar Beard Club for like beard products and whatnot. And my buddy Dan Doby, he runs all like their commercials. It's all internet stuff, but he, he's the editor and director for all their commercials. And he put me in about their last two or three internet commercials that have gotten a ton of views. So I'm, I've been kind of doing that. But the agent thing is, of course, my full time career. But the acting thing is like, it's weird. Like so many people have came out and been like, give it a shot because like, you're actually pretty funny. Which is nice because you're here in LA. You can do both. Yeah. I don't think of myself as an actor, but other people are like, you're funny, like run with it. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to go out there, run around town and like start auditioning everywhere. I don't have time. I have 27 clients on my roster. So it's tough, you know? It'll also be a little 
funny if you were represented by William Morris or something. <laughs> Seriously, right? <laughs> Inner workings that I'm rep- represented Actually, by them. It wouldn't be the worst thing in the world because it's like they, they would never really want to poach an act from one of their own clients. <laughs> it, it might protect your roster a little bit. You could probably. But think about that. <laughs> You've had some really good success over the last couple of years. Some of your bands are really seeing some success. Circle Talent, you know, it's one of those things where the company was formed actually on electronic music. You know, they had 200 DJs. And the beginning was the bass world, the dubstep bass world. And it was the agency group for four and a half years. And, you know, mentored by Andy Summers, Bruce Solar, you know, Shapiro and a bunch of those guys over there. In the Gabe West. and all those guys. Gabe. Yeah. That was like the era I was in. You yeah, know? Bill Wolf. Yeah, Val and Christian Bernhard and even Guy Richard a little bit later on. Probably dollar for dollar, the best agent by the books in the business. Guy Richard's the man, dude. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a the great man. agent. He's great. And uh, Andy Zumberg, who you know was his assistant, who's now an agent, came from him. So like that era of agency group was some of the best times of my life. But things happen and whatever. I went to Circle and Circle had no, you know, they had no rock music, no guitars, nothing. And then that's when Steve Gordon and Kevin Gimbel found out I was available and were like, hey, we want you to come in to jumpstart the live department. Now it's been three years and it's me and Dan Rosenblum, Matt Pike. And now we have close to 100 non-EDM clients being together for like not even two years, which is great. My roster, I mean, like it's once again, it's all over the place from YouTubers to you know, I do Insane Clown Posse to Lords of Acid to um, We Came as Romans. So and YouTuber influencer dudes. So Lords um, of Acid just went out with a really cool package they put together. Christian Death was on that Christ. package. Yeah. 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 That was our tour that Dan and I worked on. And yeah, that tour did great in Seattle. Crushed in Seattle. Actually. The show box, right? Yeah. I think, you know, a little it was cool tickets. that they put together all the exit tour throughout the 90s together. Everybody came out for one night and put them all together again, which was great. I don't think I, I've seen Christian Death on the Road in like 15 years or something. It was so cool. And Lords of Acid fans, they haven't been here in, you know, seven, eight years. So it was a big deal. It's like for a family that. reunion, so yeah, to speak. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, everyone was dressed up in costumes and yeah, the it, black was out. It got weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just goth. There's definitely this the bondage. Well, yeah, the S&M. And, you know, yeah. it's fun just to people watch because people wear the things at those shows that you would see on a real really random website or something, you know, it's like the crypt come to life for sure. I mean, but the tour did great, you know, the tour crushed in Chicago on Halloween, the LA, did, I mean, everything did great. I mean, a couple you know, Oklahoma city and Albuquerque were a little bit light, I would say, but I mean, that's those markets. So you play the sunshine in Albuquerque with that? Yeah, yeah, I did. Okay. So it's a smaller market though. Yeah, you yeah, wouldn't think that market. it performed nearly as well. And I imagine Denver at like Denver, Korea. Yeah. Where'd you play the Ogden? Yeah. Yeah. That was a great tour. It's been a journey though, you know, with having Dan, you know, who was at UTA, Mr. Rosenblum, he was there and Matt Pike came more agency for 15 years. So we all have kind of collectively come together to build up this live department, which has been awesome. Yeah, it's a neat thing. You guys are clearly making a name for yourselves in the industry as a rock touring agency, opposed to the EDM agency that was always respected yeah. in the it's, business. It's cool because Excision and all these big, like Marshmallow and all these big DJs we have on the roster, a lot of these dudes listen to metal music. It's so bizarre. Well, they're just producers, really. So, like, they're really huge into, like, what's going into those albums. Like, Excision's like one of our biggest bass acts. I mean, we did two nights or three nights at the Palladium with him. He comes on stage with a devil driver or a suicide silence shirt on like he loves death metal and metal you know marshmallow he's friends with a ton of our rock bands on the warp tour you know attila icy stars all these bands he comes out to and supports and it's like now it's like when i talk to some of the djs on the roster they're like yo circle has like my favorite metal bands on the roster so you were seeing like this like collaboration or even crossover brotherhood and you know with the clients a lot of the acts that you work with in that genre i did a lot of that stuff when i was partners at thrasher that's music that used to get airplay on radio and in pop radio in some cases and that's kind of fallen away but the genre seems to have come back now that the internet and Spotify and Pandora have made that music more readily available again. Have you seen a resurgence since those platforms have come to life? I mean, yeah, I mean, Spotify for sure. Spotify I, I think is still trying to figure out the rock metal playlist. I feel it's still very heavily hip hop, even indie and like EDM based. You know, the metal rock stuff. I haven't really found an artist or I don't think they've ever broken an artist through Spotify in the rock metal scene yet. Maybe they have. I just haven't seen it. Pandora, I don't really use much, but Spotify for me has been a big factor of stats and top cities and showing promoters, you know, the streaming numbers. But I still think YouTube for me is 
the top one you know, when it comes down to a and And for me, at least, like, i rather see a video have X amount of views than see a song on Spotify have X amount of streams. Cause... Yeah, I don't know that I really look at the Spotify numbers when I'm researching an act, but I, I look at Twitter followers. Okay. I look at Facebook numbers. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. I do look at the YouTube numbers, particularly if they're touting that they're big YouTuber type of acts, because that's a big space for us now. The Instagram, too. You know, it's, it's about the engagement, seeing, like, okay, this band has 30,000 followers, and but the engagement's pretty high. I l- rather have that than an artist that has 3 million followers, and, and the interaction's very, very small, because it might be, something might be a little off there. So it's, a lot of this stuff is still diluted, and because followers can be bought, and, you know, you just gotta kind of sift through all that stuff. So, so what's your process in signing an act? What do you sign, and how do bands come to you? I mean, I know it's old school, but the music's definitely got to be there, you know, first. Are you a live show guys that got to stand up live? Don't get me wrong, you know, when I first started being an agent, I made it like a point to be like, I want to make sure I can see an artist before I sign them. That's how, for me, how it was quote, quote, back then. Now it's hard to like just fly across sometimes the country to see an artist sometimes. And sometimes you got to take a gamble and just sign an act that, yeah, you haven't seen live yet, but believe in their music. Are you more likely to do that if somebody that you trust brings them to you? Always, yeah. I mean, if a manager or, you know, promoter or someone recommends me a band in their market or just like, oh, this band rolled through without an agent and did 500 tickets like on their own, you should check this out. Of course, I'm going to give it a peek because my buyers, like my dudes, those are my brothers and my sisters. I trust them with everything, you know? But going back to your question, I would say uh, definitely, you know, the music's got to be there. It has to be believable. I have to somewhat feel something or at least see something, right? I was one of the first promoters ever for Insane Clown Posse outside of Detroit. Okay. I promoted Albuquerque with Joe Anderson. He didn't know what it was. I called him. I was like, we got to do this. Our guarantee was $150. Uh, I bought it for Denver at the Ozatlan Theater the first time through. Okay. And they rolled through with a semi, a Winnebago, and a van. All with the full wraps. And I know that's common now, but it wasn't then. Mm -hmm. And it was something because I knew about the Fago and I was okay with it. And I've done gore shows, so I had kind of had a good idea on how to work with it. And so rolling in, we're watching this full crew and it was like a mini arena show. I mean, it it was kind of funny because we had Pig Face the same week and Pig Face had almost the same number of people out on the road as this act that I paid $150 for. We knew there was something going on. There was a buzz, but it was underground and there was no radio. And I sold like, I don't know, 550 tickets in Denver the first time in. And they walked with real back end. Okay. And you know, I got to watch that build into being an arena thing. But over the years, they've hit Broken a Radio Song and they've been an arena act and then they've come back down to the clubs. Yep. They've bounced back and forth. There's an act that in every market they're worth different, but at every point of time, they're an arena or a club act or a ballroom act. And it's amazing how their career has fluctuated and they've continued to ride that wave. Yeah. This is about a six, seven month relationship so far. So it's rather new, but I've been, we've been learning so much just about them on the road and like what they need and what the show, you know, as from a promoter standpoint, from the carpet to the tarp and their crew is super pro on the road. I mean, they got it dialed in like glue, you know, like 20 years in the making or 25 years of been touring. So they have right. it down these dudes. We did a 20 anniversary of the great Malenko, which as you know, that was our biggest album. It was right. a pretty big deal. Yeah. Yes. They're not what they used to be. You can say that about a lot of artists, right? But they sustain to the point where they make a living, provide for their families. They created this movement. And yeah, they had the Juggalo March, which was just huge. It, it, was, it was a huge thing, you know? And like what we helped them with was the concert afterwards, after the March, which sold out and was a smaller venue. But to get the venue that we wanted to, like it was tough because a lot of people didn't, people don't mess with the clowns still. People don't want the Fago. They think them and their fans, or at least their fans are a gang. And that's the issue because we had not one problem on that whole tour there was not one fight so i mean which club do you want it playing i wish we can do denver but we did boulder the boulder theater which on a monday night sold out i mean 1200 tickets on a monday night that's pretty impressive you know on a high ticket it's like 35 40 dollar ticket now you know right. so boulder theater you know we did the gas monkey in dallas you know i mean we did a couple under plays like in jerome idaho i mean they can't play knitting factory venues for some reason oh, is there a problem uh, there yeah i don't know what it is um and knitting factory has banned them from all their venues so we'll see you know they'll never ever play a knitting factory show which we couldn't play a boise knitting factory it had to be jerome idaho which is like a 400 cap room which they blew out in like a week so there were a couple across wisconsin's and a couple smaller markets we played some small rooms 
generally we're in that thousand to twenty two hundred range for that tour. So they did great. Now we're gonna go back out with them in March and do a co headline with Attila and head PE and mix it up and when you do a co headline with them, they have to play last anyway, right? Because they destroy with the Fago. They are playing last every single night. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like you, you go on stage after war. No, no, not not at all. But it's been a great experience. Bill from Psychopathic is awesome to work with. You know, he has you know the great relationship with the guys, and he's been letting us kind of do our thing and package them and kind of be open. It's been cool. It's been nice. And they've created their own genre of music where there are four or five other acts yep. that have spun off from this. They've created their own thing, much like Atmosphere. It's yep. the Rhyme Sayer stuff. It's yep. amazing how cool that is where it's its own thing. Yep. You know, the Gathering of the Jugglos every year is a huge deal. Yeah. I think this year they did in Oklahoma City and I don't think it was the right venue. So I think we're hopefully going to help them look for a new venue um, and a new spot next year. Can't say much about it, to be honest, but in it's the, in the works. Yeah, it's in the works of now moving us somewhere way more marquee than Oklahoma. So we'll see what happens next year. Are you a Juggalo fan? You know, it's funny. I didn't really grow up listening to them. You weren't going chicken hunting? I wasn't going chicken hunting. <laughs> um, I wasn't wearing the paint or anything. I mean, of course, I knew who they were. Uh, we went to the show at the Observatory in Santa Ana. Me, Matt Pike, and Dan Rosenblum, we all work together on ICP. It's not just me. We're very team-oriented dudes. And it's all about the Riddlebox. It's all about the Riddlebox and, and, and the Malenko, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it's called Fago Armageddon, <laughs> where uh, if you buy a VIP ticket, you get to go on stage with the guys and spray Fago, the last song with everyone. It's not okay that look like and <laughs> you know whatever and literally the, the tour manager goes so yo you guys want to be like a fago you want to join in and it felt like that was like our initiation like it's like how do you say no to that yeah, Fuck yeah, yeah man <laughs> we were like you know what let's do it next thing you know me and matt are on stage spraying fago everywhere and to be honest it was one of the most fun shows i've ever been to in a long a very very long time the energy the fans spraying fago on people was pretty fun actually <laughs> wish you could do that in daily life like we should walk through billboard with a bunch of bottles of fago just like, <laughs> yeah no awesome. reduction fuck you fago <laughs> he's a fago bottle <laughs> <laughs> so what's coming up this year that you're excited about what's in the works outside of the band stuff i would say got this kid danny duncan he's the whole youtube influencer danny's from florida and he's just tell people he's like the new johnny knoxville i would say you know oh, kind of that jackass vibe yeah he doesn't like staple like his nutsack to his leg or crazy well because that's been done yeah exactly <laughs> but he doesn't do like that extreme stuff he's sober and doesn't drink and he's not into drugs he's not a prankster but he's just a funny dude he's amazing and i just recently started working with him and we're doing his first event down in san diego at, in soma i've been actually curious Creating the actual show, like what will it consist of? Because he doesn't play music, he's not a band. So we're actually putting together like this kind of comedy sketch show for his fans. And we went on sale two weeks ago, and I think we're at 600 tickets in two weeks, which is great. I mean, I think we're going to sell out and do 1,100 tickets. The $100 VIPs blew out in the two days. Nice. And the other 400 and some on tickets. And now we're starting to really pick it up. So we're at 600. So that's exciting. That's cool. So it's different too. It's not just like routing and booking a Albuquerque, this, this, and that. It's actually helping curate this actual experience. You so know, you're producing. Fans. Yeah, producing it from the production to everything, you know, so it's been really fun. It's so cool. we uh, we had our first foray into that a couple of years ago with Miranda Sings, and mm -hmm. we just continually have done more and more of that, Rose and Rosie, what have you. It's a different connection to the audience because of their different platform. The connections that they have to the fans is amazing. Done the whole VidCon playlist live, that whole world of YouTube is, it's only getting bigger. And a lot of these kids, they don't know Michael Jordan or they don't look up to LeBron James. They don't play sports. A lot of them aren't maybe popular kids, but they look up to these YouTuber kids. And that's their Michael Jordan and their LeBron James. And it might seem weird to us, but no, that this, this is just a new generation. They look at Danny Duncan or some of these Jenna Marbles and these people and like look at them like that it seems like there's just so many more platforms that originally was out there in the past where when radio was dominant the internet's changed that you've got podcasts now which is a huge touring business you now have all these youtubers that are learning how to produce shows some of them are good at it i think miranda is possibly the best at it and has shown the rest of them how to curve that into shows because you've got a lot of these kids that can produce a video that can go viral but they can't necessarily hold an audience for a live show and i think that's the challenge that we're moving forward with the industry is 
making something that's not only going to sell a room out once, but is good enough for people to come back again. Yeah. Are you I, seeing that to be the challenge? No, it is. I mean, with Danny, for instance, it's like, you know, I had to really sit down and go over like what the actual show will consist of because it can't just be a meet and greet. There has to be more to it for people to want to come back because they feel like they got a bang for their buck. You can't just do, hey, meet me here. Yeah, you can do that and say, meet me here for a meetup and charge your fans. But to be the biggest of the biggest, you have to think bigger than just a meet and greet. That's how I think about it, you know? Yeah, they want to meet the YouTuber. They want to meet the person. That's a big part of it, yes. But everything else is important. It makes it more of an experience than just a meet and greet, you know? And that's what we're doing with Danny. Like, we're bringing in production, you know, actual, like, confetti and not, not pyro, but actual, like, the, all these sparkler things on the ground. And he's coming out on stage with his dirt bike and a little ramp we built and the whole thing, you know? People are so grasping and wrapping their head around the whole thing. Kind of like the esports world, too. I mean, that whole world is just a... Uh, yeah, arenas filling in with people <laughs> playing video games. That thing is just out of control, you know? And I'd been dabbling in that space as well. I did an event back at Club Nokia when it was Club Nokia you know, a couple years ago with Eric Milhouse, actually. They were called Team Crafted, which were they were like the five top YouTubers that play the game Minecraft. And they formed a team and we did like 800, 900 tickets. Kids from all over the world flew in for this event. A family from Mexico flew in, a family from Jersey, New York, Seattle. I mean, you guys, Milhouse, it was crazy. So I dabble in that space and that's not the esports world. That was more Minecraft, but that esports gamer Twitch stuff is only getting getting bigger as video games get bigger and better, you know? You've not put yourself in any box saying this is what I do to make money. You are open to any opportunity that you feel is real entertainment that you can sell to the public. 100%. I think that stems back to being at the agency group and them always being cool with not one particular, like, you're an agent of this roster or this genre. Like, Andy and those guys were always so like, if you feel it, you feel it, you know? Don't pigeonhole yourself to just one particular genre of music, you know? So guy that books GBH and Brian Wilson. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, then you got Pennywise, right? Throw, them in the, throw that in the mix, you know? Um, I used to be a gamer, you know, when I was growing up. So video games is a big part of my life. And then, you know, sports, you know, so I try to utilize that when it comes down to work too, because I think any good businessman or woman would agree to having your hands in different pockets is beneficial. You know, you meet so many different people, you know, too. Before I let you go, can you give a shout out to some of the younger guys that are coming up in the business, whether they're promoters or agents or managers that are really starting to like come on that you are seeing from your point of view? Uh, I would say Jason Malhoyt, uh, Imperial Artist Management. Uh, he manages a bunch of my younger up-and-coming metal bands. So he does a great job. As a manager, he's doing great. Yeah, my buddy Sage Kieber, he's out. He's a promoter out in Erie, Rochester, Buffalo area, Syracuse, you know, independent promoter, crushing it out there. Fernadi from ENT Legends, he's like the young independent promoter up in Sacramento doing all the hip-hop urban stuff. He's doing great. He's starting to dabble um, in like five or six different markets. So he's been great to work with. And also, you know, I would say Troy Lusk, you know, Troy, who's my assistant, who's pretty much now promoted as an agent. I mean, he came in with no experience, only tour management experience. And now he has, you know, that band called The Frights, who, you know, did Ohana Festival, Lollapalooza. Yeah, they're coming on. Yeah, they're, they're popping off right now. And I can say I'm really excited for Troy. I mean, he came into the company two and a half years ago with no roster and then sitting with him and, and developing him listening. Now he has the Frights in the garden who just supported Matt DeMarco and he's doing a great job, Troy. So I'm, I'm excited he's on our team as well. Awesome. That's a great thing. Thank you so much for taking time and talking to us on Promoter 101. Yeah, thanks, brother. He's an actor. He's an agent. Most of all, he's a well-respected member of our music industry's inner circle. You gotta love JJ. My name is Tom Windish, and I'm on Promoter 101. Hey, celebrating birthdays this week, January 12 to 18, 2018. Friday, January 12th. Happy birthday to Spokane Arena's Matt Gibson and Mills Entertainment's Justin Levy. Saturday, Michael Bush, Michelle Sabo, and Dave Whitnack. On Sunday, let's wish a happy birthday to Tyler Boone, Billions' Allie Hendrick, and Doug Isaac. Monday, Eric Abel. On Tuesday, wishing a happy birthday to Psycho Steve Presents, Steve Chilton. Second shout out on this podcast. The Crocs, Hunter Moto, and CAA's Lee Goforth. Wednesday, the Reading Civic Center's Nathan Permley. On Thursday, that's the 18th, happy birthday to Seattle Theater Group's Ryan Cook. Happy birthday to all of you from the gang at Promoter 101. I don't really see ourselves as a gang as much as like a really furious mopedding team. Yeah, I think if we were a gang, we'd like you know need to learn to sing and dance and like have nicknames, Dan. I don't think we, we've done that so far. 
I like that you, gangs in your head are like a West Side Story kind of thing with like high kicks and songs. I was thinking Crips and Bloods, but, you know, I guess that's the uh, difference in our upbringing where you come from the upper class world and I come from the middle upper class world. <laughs> I, I think that uh, you're just you're just missing the obvious West Ring reference that I made with President Barton Liam McGarry talking about. Season oh, to the gang. We're going to get jackets made. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So uh, Danny's in the office, right? I, I don't no, no, no. <laughs> it's it's not it's not in the office. It's, it's it's in the situation room where Toby and Josh are lost somewhere in Indiana, and Fitz and Leo are down in the situation room with the president, and they're talking about uh, being a well financed gang because that's basically what they are at this point. If they've assassinated the defense minister of the fictitious Kumar Abdul Sharif, and so they're talking about being a well financed gang, and Bartlett's going on about how. We're going to need to uh, see, you know, learn to sing and dance. And you know, when it comes time for Leo, who's spoiling his party, to get the gang nicknames, Leo's not going to get a good gang nickname. Okay, now that you say the nicknames, I remember that. But I was thinking you were talking about when Danny was asked up to the Oval and Leo was in there and they were trying to get a source out so he, Jed Bartlett didn't have to have a discussion with his wife about who the source was. And that, welcome to the club, Danny. We're going to have jackets made. That's the reference I thought you were making in West Wing. But as we nerd out, let's... Get back to the podcast. <laughs> hey, this is Craig Newman. JJ Kassiri. Louis Messina. Sarah Pelch. Dan Berkowitz. Jake Gold. Bob Rupp. Lucy lawler Fries, Dave Geller. Andy Summers. Simon Scholl. Scott Aller. Pete Shapiro. Mike Ducharme. Rick Schultz. Lucas Keller. And you're listening to Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Put down your inhibitions and pick up a cool glass of Promoter 101. Our third feature interview this week, we're going to be joined by Indianapolis's best from G Entertainment, R&B concert promoter Gino Shelton. Mr. Gino Shelton, how are you doing, my friend? What's going on, my friend? Long time, man. We go back, boy, we go back. We were both pups when we started, man. We go back a long way. Let's talk about it. Now, Indianapolis is your market. You were the guy there. If it's urban music, you were in the center of it. Not even Live Nation plays that game without keeping you in the middle of it. Yeah, I mean, I've been pretty blessed, man. Thank God that for all the years that I've lived here, I've been able to keep my hand on the pulse of the people, whether it's young or old, and still be useful. You know what I mean? It's, it's about being relevant, man. And it's about knowing the latest trends. You already know the game. You Knowing who's hot, who's not. You know, who's got longevity and knowing track record. Since I've lived here and was on the radio here, it's been to my advantage. But I've been blessed. I'm not going to lie. I've been very blessed. You have a niche in your market. You live in that R&B world. Yeah. What happened for me, different than most promoters, is that I was in the music first as far as the actual, you know, not necessarily the former, but a guy that was on the radio every single day. And basically doing that back in the 80s when you were on the radio, there's, you know, maybe one urban station in the entire city. So if people wanted to go to a show, if they wanted to hear about something in the urban world back then, there was no Internet. There was no social media. You know, it was just radio, radio and TV, and radio was the dominant player when it comes to the music scene. So, you know, with me being on radio, with some success in radio, it was just a natural fit for me to be able to evolve into the whole concert arena. And you've moved on from just doing urban artists to doing comedy, lifestyle comedy, comedy that's very much part of that same urban ticket buyer world. Yeah, I um, Def Comedy Jam just celebrated its 25th anniversary this year. Um, 1992 was when the first episodes came out. And next year, 1993, I started a thing called the Hip Hop Comedy Shop because there are a lot of people in the industry, well, you know, there were a lot of black people in the industry that knew this comedy thing was getting ready to be the next big thing. Places like the Comedy Act Theater in LA and Chicago, People like Robin Harris were this, this underground chitlin circuit group of comedians out there that were just kind of storming the. And that's how Russell Simmons came up with the idea of doing Death Comedy Jam. So, thus from there, you know, we just kind of, you know, most of the black promoters, you know, because we knew the acts, we knew who people loved, whatever, took a hold of it, man. And, you know, think about it, look at all the stars that came out of that whole Death Comedy Jam scene Chris Tucker to Kevin Hart to D.O. Hughley. I mean, you name it, man. They are all out of that game. I mean, it's funny how, and I know you know this as well. Is how you start out with somebody who you just start in in the industry with. There, you know, back in the days when they charged twenty five hundred dollars and are willing to sleep in your in the back of your car to go from that to doing arena shows. You know, and and I've seen that. You know, with Def Comedy Jam, with the Kings of Comedy. You know, those were guys that was doing clubs, and you know now you had four guys: Steve Harvey, Bernie Mac, God Rest His Soul, or DL and and Cedric went on to do arena across the country with one of the biggest comedy tours probably of all time. Well, next to, well, I guess Kevin Hart now is probably beating that record. But yeah, it's just crazy, man. You know, comedy, music, been crazy. It's, like, it's been a great ride. Did you literally have them sleeping in your car? You wouldn't even let them in the house when these guys were young? What the hell, dude? <laughs> 
That was just a, that was just an analogy. But uh, I will tell you something. And because you know you and I are grassroots kind of guys, I'm from back in the day when Moby was hot. You know, in the whole techno world, Moby rolled in the back of my Hyundai XL to the radio station to do an interview on a radio station that didn't even play his music. The group called the Fat Boys, the rappers from back in the days, sat in my hatchback of my car, and literally the back of my car was like tilted for me trying to take them from screening fans that were in one spot. We, I had to take them back to a record store, and they're in the back seat of a hatchback, you know, laughing and throwing stuff at, at fans. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I know I would never let somebody sleep in my car, but, you know, it's, I'm just saying they come from those roots, from those humble roots that some of these guys came from. It seems like it's a different world out there. Now, you've got the mainstream music industry, and then the urban market seems to have its own genre. When the acts get big enough, they cross over to real promoters like yourself for a Live Nation or an AEG, but there's a whole bunch of like lower-level guys just trying to scrape it out and break into the industry, which I guess happens in any genre, but in the urban world, it seems to be a bigger thing. So, is having a legit reputation in the business a more paramount thing on that side of the business because there's so many people trying to pull things off that aren't legitimate? Dan, well, keep in mind, man, me and you were one of those little guys from back in the day. The only difference between us and them is the fact that, you know, we were stand-up guys. And we realized that if we were going to have any kind of longevity in this business, that we've got to be men of our word and we've got to do what we said we were going to do. So I want to definitely make your listeners understand that you and I are cut from that independent cloth, whereas Live Nation is a corporation that, you know, basically, poof, I'm here, I got millions and billions of dollars, I'm going to do shows. So, but, but I do understand what you're saying as far as the German guys and guys actually doing shows and doing the right thing. To answer your question, it's funny that you say that because I'm noticing the trend now is less and less guys that want to do what we do. Other than maybe the rap shows and some of the rappers, I'm seeing a decline of guys who want to be a true blue promoter. And I guess, I don't know if that's my world, that's Midwest, what that is, but if somebody had to ask me who that next guy was going to be in Indianapolis, I couldn't tell you as far as promoters are concerned. I couldn't tell you because I just don't see anybody stepping up to the plate. You know, and maybe it does to attest to the fact that most of these guys are, you know, jack late guys and they're not really doing that good of a job. But I don't see anybody trying when it comes to stuff that me and you might be doing. I don't see anybody trying to do it. Where back in the day, me and you, we used to get into the big boys' head because we were trying to do shows that they were doing, but they were always be able to snatch them up because they had more money than us. But we were trying. We were trying to make those relationships. We were trying to do big shows, bigger and better things. But I don't see these guys trying anymore, man. You've been in the business for going on 30 years. How do you make it that long in this industry? You know, Dan, I told guys, some of the young guys, you know, that ask the questions just like that, and it's kind of weird. I'm going to probably give you an answer that you probably haven't received from any of the other promoters you've ever interviewed. You know, there's either two things that you can do in my business to stay alive, and that's either drink, which is 90% of the guys in my business are drinkers, or you pray. I'm a prayer. And I say all that to say that because of my faith in God, because of how I believe the moral fiber of the guy that I am, because I love the music industry, really the key is you treat people the way you want them to be treated, which is some could say a biblical quote, but I just say it's a lifestyle quote. You know, and when you do that, especially when you come to the artist, it comes back, man. You know, a lot of these artists, they get big time, they get big money, and they leave you. But at the end of the day, you keep going in this business because of the quality of what you do. You keep treating people the right way. You know, think about what you're doing right now. If you became broke, there are buildings that would give you the room for free because they know what you've done in the past. There are sound companies that would give you the sound for free, maybe not forever, but for that one show to help you get on your feet because you gained a reputation of quality and excellence in this business. If you're going to do this, if you're going to do this business, you know, there's, been a, there's a whole bunch of snakes and con artists and what have you. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, they don't have the same phone number they had a week ago, okay? Me and you, we've got the same telephone number we've had for 25 years, 30 years. And that's the testament of being in this business. You know, you're consistent. You stay positive. You stay focused. You have to work hard. It ain't a, it's not a game. You know, you're going to work hard. You're going to piss off some of the people that you love around you. But at the end of the day, man, if you do right by people. That's that's how you last. 
that's how it keeps it going. I appreciate it, man. Hey, before I let you go, I want to point out that one of the favorite things in the industry is our relationship, because when I met you at CIC, which has turned into Polestar Live now, the first year that thing ever existed, I remember having this conversation of like going to make friends with the guy that's doing the same thing you are in the same market. It's going to be hard to get advice, but talking to the guy that promotes a different genre of music in a different part of the country and trading ideas, there's a guy that's going to feel comfortable talking to you forever. You and me have kept up a relationship ever since. And, you know, whether it's me promoting Circle Jerks in one market and you promoting Tony, Tony, Tony or Mint Condition in another, we're both putting asses in seats and that's what it comes down to. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. I've always appreciated you, man, and the fact that you, you love this business. You are a fan of what we do. I've always admired that about you. A legend in our business, Gino Shelton, rocking the world. Thanks for joining us on Promoter 101, my friend. Man, thank you so much, man. And love and kisses to all of the people out there, man. Keep buying tickets, man. We need you. OG needs the money. Talk about a guy that works on every level. He's a hustler, and I mean that in the best sense of the way. I'm so proud to call Gino a longtime friend of mine. Hey, this is Mark Geiger from WME, William Morris Endeavor Entertainment, coming to you on Dan Steinberg's podcast. If you want to reach out to us, send us an email to steiny at promoter101.net. A brand new thing we're doing now is quotes of the week, and this one comes to us from Jason Zink. I have a whole lot more respect for evil over stupid. Fun quote, Luke. Sounds like something Jason Zink would say. We'll be back next week on our live interview from FlyCon with Brooklyn Bulls and Lock and Festival's Peter Shapiro. Until then, we're wishing you sold out shows for the weeks to come. Cheers. Cheers. This is Peter Schwartz, WMA in New York on Promoter 101. 